This lecture focuses on the design of the tension members in a simple pedestrian bridge. The design of steel tension members entails satisfying two sets of criteria. Strength criteria, which we discussed in previous lectures, and a slenderness ratio criterion. In this lecture, we will use our acquired knowledge to design the members that undergo tension in the steel trusses forming the bridge. The bridge consists of a truss structure on each side of an 11-foot wide deck. The structure is subjected to three load types, dead load, live load, and snow load. The weight of the bridge deck and the two trusses is dead load. Pedestrians, cyclists, and light vehicles exert live load on the bridge. Furthermore, the structure could be subjected to snow load. Given the dimensions and location of the bridge, wind, earthquake, and other dynamic loads can be ignored. The weights of the deck, snow, and pedestrians can be viewed as uniformly distributed loads. The vehicular weight is to be modeled as two concentrated loads. We need to consider two additional dead loads. We treat the weight of each cross beam and each truss member as a dead load. We can assume the weight of each steel member is distributed equally to its end joints. For example, the weight of this cross beam distributes to these two joints. And this cross beam distributes its weight to these joints. Similarly, the weight of each truss member can be placed at its end joints as gravity loads, like this. Suppose the weight of the deck is 80 pounds per square foot. Since the deck rests on two cross beams, the magnitude of the distributed load acting on each beam can be calculated as shown here. And since each end of the cross beam is connected to a truss joint, each interior joint along the bottom cord of the truss takes 8.8 .8 kips of the dead load. We can distribute the snow load to the bottom joints of each truss in a similar manner. First, we transfer the deck snow load to the cross beams as uniformly distributed loads. These loads can then be transferred to the truss joints. Each joint takes half of the total load on the beam. In this case, the load per joint equals 16.5 kips. The pedestrian load per square foot of the deck is 90 pounds. This results in a distributed load of 1,800 pounds per linear foot on the cross beams. Therefore, the effect of the pedestrian load per truss joint equals 9.9 .9 kips. For the truck load, we are going to use the load recommended by the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials. The recommended load consists of two concentrated loads with a distance of 14 feet between them. The load exerted by the front axle of the hypothetical truck equals 2 kips. The load transferred to the deck surface from the rear axle of the truck is 8 kips. Since the distance between the two cross beams is 14 feet, the truck load transfers to these beams as shown here. Therefore, the truss joint near the front axle takes a vehicular load of 1 kip, and the truss joint near the rear axle of the truck takes a vehicular load of 4 kips. Here is a summary of the deck loads acting at the truss joints. For truss analysis, we need to keep the following observations in mind. For the dead load, P and Q are present at all times. For the snow load, since snow can be partially removed from the bridge deck, only one of the loads could be present and acting on the truss. The same is true for the pedestrian load. The truss could be subjected to either P or Q, and not both. 
although both P and Q must be present for the vehicular load, but since the direction of the truck can be reversed, the magnitudes of P and Q are interchangeable. Furthermore, according to the Ashto specifications, pedestrian and vehicular loads are not present at the same time. If the bridge is loaded with pedestrians, then no truck load is present. And vice versa. In this case, since the pedestrian load is larger than the truck load, we can omit the latter load from consideration. That is, the pedestrian load, not the vehicular load, governs the design of tension members. Let us assume the steel members used in the bridge do not weigh more than 50 pounds per foot. Put differently, we assume a dead load of 50 pounds per foot for the steel members in the bridge. Therefore, the weight of each cross beam can be viewed as a uniformly distributed load of 50 pounds per foot. Since each cross beam has a length of 11 feet, the dead load of the member equals 50 times 11, or 550 pounds. This load is transferred to the two end joints of the member. Each joint takes half of the load. Therefore, each interior joint of the truss along its bottom cord is subjected to a load of 275 pounds. Given the geometry of the truss, we can calculate the dead load due to each member and place it at the member's end joints. For example, the dead load of this member is 50 times 13, or 650 pounds. We place half of the load at each end of the member. So, we end up with 325 pounds at each of these joints. Similarly, the dead load for this member equals 350 pounds. So, we place a gravity load of 175 pounds at each end joint of the member. We get this load diagram when we superimpose the truss member weights and cross beam weights at the joints. Adding the joint loads due to the weight of steel to the joint loads due to the weight of the deck, we get the total dead load that the truss must carry. The analysis of the truss under the dead load results in the following member forces. The tension forces are shown in blue. For this analysis, we assumed the truss is simply supported. The truss subjected to live load can be analyzed in a similar manner. Under full pedestrian load, the following member forces develop in the truss. If only the left half of the truss is loaded, the member forces become. And if the pedestrian load exists only on the right half of the structure, we get these member forces. When snow is present on the entire deck of the bridge, member forces become. We get these member forces if only the left half of the deck is loaded with snow. And, we get these forces when snow is present on the right half of the deck only. Here is a summary of the analysis results. The members shown in blue remain in tension under all three loading cases. The diagonal members shown in purple are in tension for some load patterns, and in compression for other load patterns. As was shown previously, when the pedestrian or snow load acts at joint 2 only, this member carries a tensile force. Otherwise, the member is in compression. Also, when the pedestrian or snow load acts at joint 3 only, member 37 carries a tensile force. Otherwise, the member remains in compression. The table shows the maximum tensile force in each member under each load type. Note that the two diagonal members carry a compressive force of 0.6 kips under dead load. Since the applied loads can be present on the bridge simultaneously, we must combine them according to the governing design specifications. For the design of tension members subjected to dead load and live load, 
Ashto provides the following load combination equation. For pedestrian bridges, however, Ashto does not account for snow load. To consider the impact of snow load, we use three additional load combination equations given in a publication entitled, Sustainable Trail Bridge Design, published by the Forest Service of the United States Department of Agriculture. The equations are Since equation 1 is included in equation 3, we only need to work with equations 2 through 4. When we substitute these forces in the three equations, we get the following factored design forces for the tension members. Since equation 4 produces the largest force for the members, it governs the design. Therefore, our tension members need to be designed for these forces. Let's design members 1, 2, 2, 3 and 3-4 for a tension force of 100 kips. Similarly, we can design members 2-6 and 3-8 for a tension force of 55 kips. And we design diagonal members 2-7 and 3-7 for a tension force of 20 kips. To facilitate the design of truss members for tension, Let's make a few assumptions. We are going to use standard W shapes with A36 grade steel for the members. The end connections for each member use at least two rows of bolts, with three bolts in each row. The assumed bolt spacings are shown here. We shall use bolts having three quarters inch diameter. The design criteria that we need to consider are We can use the yield criteria to determine the required gross cross-sectional area for the members. The yield strength is given by this equation. This strength has to be greater than or equal to the factor tension force in the member. For A36 steel, Fy is 36 ksi. Therefore, we can calculate the minimum required cross-sectional area for the members. It equals 3.09 square inches. Knowing the required gross area, let's select a few candidate standard W shapes from the AISC manual. These are the lightest possible W shapes that satisfy the gross cross-sectional area requirement. For checking the rupture of the net section criteria, we need to know the thickness of the flange for each standard section, they are given here. The design strength for the rupture of the net section can be expressed using this equation. This strength value has to be greater than or equal to the factored force in the member. In this equation, F sub U equals 58 KSI, and A sub E equals U times A sub N, where U is the shear lag factor and A sub N is the net cross-sectional area. This diagram shows the cross-section of the tension members. The net area can be calculated by subtracting the area due to the holes from the gross area. Since there are four holes in the cross-section, we can write the net area as the gross area, minus, 4 times the whole diameter times the thickness of the flange. So the net area can be written as. Using this equation, we can determine the net area for each selected W shape section. The net areas are. To determine the shear lag factor, we need to know the length of the connection. The connection length is the center-to-center -center distance between the end holes. In this case, it equals 6 inches. For W-shaped cross-sections where the connections are made to the flanges, the shear lag factor can be expressed using this equation. L, the length of the connection, is 6. Here, X-bar is the distance from the geometric center of half of the section to the plane of the connection, 
which we have labeled as the y-axis. To determine x-bar, we need to know a few dimensions, including flange width, flange thickness, thickness of the web, overall depth of the section, and the distance from the center of the cross-section to the edge of the web. Note that Tf plus G is D over 2. Since the depths of the standard sections are given in the AISC manual, we can determine distance G for each section. X bar can be expressed using this equation. The numerator of the equation is the sum of the moments of the two colored areas about the y axis. The denominator of the equation is the total area of the colored regions, which constitutes half of the area of the entire cross-section. We can write this equation in terms of the dimensions of the cross-section. For standard W sections, BF, flange width, and TW, web thickness, are given in the AISC manual. Calculating X-bar for each section, we get Finally, using this equation, we can determine shear lag factor for each section. Back to the rupture limit state. The strength of the member against the rupture of the net section is. This strength has to be greater than or equal to 100 kips. F sub u equals 58 ksi. And since we have calculated A sub n, and the shear lag factor for each section, we can determine A sub E. For this limit state to be satisfied, 43.5 times A sub E must be greater than or equal to 100 kips. Note that 3 out of 4 standard sections satisfy the strength equation. This section however is not strong enough to carry the factored load. Therefore, we can eliminate it from further consideration. Next, let's check for the block shear strength of the member. Our tension members have holes in the two flanges. For such a member, block shear failure manifests itself in the tension force being able to tear off a flange at its edge, as illustrated here. Note the tension and shear planes associated with this block. This is the shear side and this is the tension side. To determine the strength of the member for block shear, we need to calculate three areas. Net tension area, gross shear area, and net shear area. The net tension area equals 1.5 minus half the diameter of the hole, times the thickness of the flange. For the three standard sections, the net tension areas are the gross shear area equals 7.5 times the thickness of the flange. For our sections, the gross shear areas are and the net shear area equals 7.5 minus 2.5 hole diameter times the thickness of the flange. According to the AISC specifications, the nominal strength for a flange block can be written as. This equation simplifies to. For these standard sections, 21.6 times gross shear area is less than 34.8 net shear area. Therefore, the nominal block shear strength needs to be calculated using this expression. Here are the strength values for a single block. Since the connection consists of four such blocks, the total block shear strength needs to be written as 4 times the strength reduction factor times Rn, or Since these values are greater than 100 kips, we can conclude that all three sections have adequate strength against block shear failure. 
So, these standard sections satisfy the yielding of the gross section, rupture of the net section, and block shear limit states. The remaining condition that needs to be checked is the slenderness ratio for the members. According to the AISC specifications, the slenderness ratio for the member, defined as the ratio of the length of the member to the radius of gyration of the section, must not exceed 300. The radius of gyration for each standard section is given in the AISC manual. Substituting R in this equation, we can determine the slenderness ratio for each standard section. Since these ratios are less than 300, we can conclude that all three sections satisfy the tension member design requirements. We can use either section for these tension members. Vertical members 2, 6, and 3, 8 need to be designed for a factored tensile force of 55 kips. These members have a length of 7 feet. Since these standard sections are adequate for a longer member subjected to a larger force, they will also work for these members. So, we can use either of these sections for members 2, 6, and 3, 8. Similarly, since members 2, 7, and 3, 7, are subjected to a force smaller than 100 kips, and their length is less than 14 feet, the standard sections that we have already selected work for these members as well. In summary, we can use either one of these standard sections for all the tension members in the truss structure. We will begin discussing the design of compression members in the next lecture.